What is the best composition? Are there two men at arms that when put together are more than the sum of their parts? Since the Lance update in May 2023, the incentive to monostack was over, making way more options viable and giving us the chance to mix it up. But should we? Is there any benefit? Do any of these cultural incentives even work? Bows and pikes, got it, wait. Or cataphracts and heavy inventory? Or all four, would that even work? Or do I just stick to stacking heavy cav instead? I'm going to be honest, that last video was a primer. While I hope it was insightful, fear not, it is not required viewing for this video. It is, however, ultimately a preamble to what I really wanted to know. Do mixed compositions matter? Time for some more graphs. So in the last video, the chart I thought was most insightful was this one. The power of every man at arms at 1000 strength. How much they cost raised on the x-axis and how many levies they can dispatch on the y-axis. So I've decided it's a bit clearer if instead of 1000 strength we do 5 stacks, a full regiment in tribal. So that's 500 troops for most and 250 strength for heavy cav. But still, how much they cost on the x-axis and how many levies they can dispatch on the y-axis. In its simplest form, the more to the left a man-at-arms is the cheaper it is. The more to the top, the better it performs. The more to the top left, the better it performs for cost, cost effectiveness. And the closer to the bottom right, the worse. And if you're a pro gamer and money is no issue for you, you can happily ignore the x-axis and instead just look at what's on top. But come on, who doesn't love a bargain? Just a little note, neither of these axes start at zero for the sake of space. Now, when comparing combinations, I think it's best to look at generics first. As comparing 1,275 combinations of all available men at arms would be a tad overwhelming and quite hard to place in one graph. I'd run out of colours. So, let's start somewhere simpler, perhaps in tribal, so what most people can easily access at the start of the game. And not that I have anything against like Cav, but their unique selling point is Pursuit and Screen, and they are doing terribly in this test, so for the sake of clarity, I am removing them for now. Don't worry, we'll come back to them later. Now, let's add the lines. These show the performance of combinations between the following two men at arms, and these X's mark where the ratio is 1 to 1. So for this line, it's 250 bikes and 250 light footmen, which cost the exact middle between both mono stacks. And either side, these new X's are marking ratios of 2 to 1 and 1 to 2. I won't be keeping these as it becomes quite messy later. But using your eye, you can figure out the ratios by yourself between the mono stacks. For example, a ratio of 1 to 3, light footmen and pikes, comes to just under 1100 levies dispatched. Does that make sense? Everybody following along? Good. The first thing you may notice is the combination of light footmen and pikes at 3 upkeep perform better than bowmen, capable of dispatching more levies for the same price. Another odd thing is the combination of pikes and bows is worse and gets worse with the gap between this combination against light footmen and pikes getting bigger as you spend more coin. Up until the point and then converging towards just pikes. If we look out further, we can see light footman and heavy infantry performs much better than bows and heavy infantry. So what's happening here? And why is it curving? Let's hold that thought. For now, let's jump to early medieval and include heavy cav, which ups the maximum levies dispatched further, though for more cost. We can see that here, pikes or heavy infantry and heavy cav combinations are doing far better than heavy cav mixed with bows or lights for the same cost beyond 4.5 upkeep. A 200 levy difference at peak, pikes and heavies having a 20% boost over bows. Finally, let's jump to high medieval where crossbows enter the stage, and here we have quite the power spike. Same cost as pikes, but way more powerful. And that is every generic man at arms with bar like Cav on the graph. But for sake of completeness, even though it gets a little busy, here is also light Cav. So, back to this curving. If you look at just bows and lights, you may expect that at a ratio of 1 to 1 will give you a number of levies dispatched exactly in the middle. But actually, combined, they dispatch more levies than one may guess. Most of the time, men at arms can be broken down into damage dealers and pain sponges. And for this combination, light footmen are able to take damage away from the bows, giving the bows more time to deal damage. They are working in synergy. Admittedly, the gains are modest, only around 1% more levies dispatched at peak, 
what a shame. That said, if you were looking at like footmen and armoured horsemen, the synergy is much better. Over 10% better at peak. And 10% better performance for nothing. Yes, please. Counter to this, looking at just pikes and bows, at a ratio of 1 to 1, they are performing worse than the exact middle. A little less levy is dealt with than expected. The problem being that the damage dealer is cheaper and the pain sponge more expensive. The bows are getting killed off quicker and the pikes are buying time to defend a unit that's, well, already dead. They are working antagonistically. Again, these differences are small and perhaps pale in comparison to the influence of terrain and countering, but comparing these combinations as a whole, there are real differences in power and should be considered if you want to transition to higher quality troops to get the most damage possible. We can see that lights or bows mixed with armoured footmen at 4.5 gold are way worse than just pikes, over 100 levies difference for the combination with bows. So perhaps if money allows and depending on how quickly you can move through the tech tree, going through pikes instead of skipping to heavies performs better. So what are the key takeaways? Are bows just terrible mixed with anything? And should you transition from lights to crossbows and from crossbows to heavy cap? Maybe. I think we need more information. If you're like me and obsessed with money, you may want to look at the levies dealt with per gold. And as in the last video, I think it's best to fill your regiment slots as quickly as possible. Overwhelming numbers, particularly in short wheels, are the best strategy and light footmen do fine. Once you fit the cap and you have some disposable income, start transitioning into the more expensive troops. There are diminishing returns in cost efficiency, but towards the late game, having a small, powerful army becomes more useful. And as with last time, you cannot avoid talking about terrain. It dominates the performance of men at arms and their combinations. For this video, I think we should look at Europe. Western Europe specifically, as that's a popular place to play, and where all the, these generic men at arms have bonuses. Places like the Middle East, India, Scandinavia, and Byzantium have their own terrains with cultural specific units, traditions, and DLC. And I don't want to review every possible combination now and lit this video with asterisks. This region here does have the Gendarme, the Hohenta, and Landsknecht, but they are not unlocked until late medieval, so you'll be doing with generics until then anyway. With the graph currently, as none of the men at arms have bonuses in farmlands, this is actually how they all perform in farmlands. So if you're defending prime real estate like notable capitals, Paris, Prague, and Amsterdam, this is how they perform. But if we're looking at lands around, typically plains, which dominates most of northern France and Germany, then heavy cav gets a huge spike of power. Pikes and heavy cav doing well and crossbows suddenly doing horrendously. Moving to hills, we see something wonderful. That pikes and horses, when alone, perform relatively well. But together, with a ratio of 1 to 1, are more than the sum of their parts. Essentially, pikes help out the heavies in their weak terrain, and otherwise, bows make a bit of a comeback. Moving on, here are the troops in mountains, where heavy cav plummets in use, and here they are in forest, where light footmen are pretty good. And that's all the places that really matter. If you're wondering about cost efficiency, because you are, like me, sadly not a pro gamer, here are the cost efficiencies of every terrain. Plains, hills, mountains, and forest. What about buffs? Well, that is something I was told I overlooked last time. So here is a graph with no buffs, and here is that same graph again, but with plus 100% to damage and toughness. Do you see the change? Yes, the y-axis, essentially. That's the only thing that changed. You buff the troops, very little happens. They all do uniformly better. That said, if you chose which regiment gets the best buff, obviously you pick the more powerful units, but you already knew that because, duh. And this is where it starts to get interesting. Let's roleplay a scenario. You have two counties, one mountains and one farmlands. Being economically weak, you use the mountains to focus on military bonuses and vice versa for farmlands. Now, let's say hypothetically you have a regiment of 
plus 100 to buff to toughness and damage, and another with none. We chose heavy infantry for the mountains, but what do we pair it with? Well, at 100%, you don't combine. You go for 100% heavy infantry. Regardless of how much upkeep you are able to splurge, that boost in power means there is no point in spending funds on anything else. But if that buff was, say, just 20% more, then you're likely to be best using a combination of boosted heavy infantry with light footmen padding out your army. Basically, you're always best off filling your regiments as quickly as possible with something, until, that is, the buffs start to get big enough. Numbers matter most until the power creeps in. To demonstrate this further, it is my privilege to introduce the third dimension. If we add a z-axis, with buffs incrementally improving, we can see what influence on performance imbalanced buffing has. The coloured points represent combinations of 500 strength and their ratios depending on upkeep. For example, here would be 100 heavy infantry and 400 low footmen. The column point with only a single men at arms type, so how many troops you can get for that upkeep. For example, here would just be 250 heavy infantry. And finally, the white points are pure mono stacks. So this line here is 500 low footmen, here 500 pikes, and here 500 heavy infantry. I appreciate there's a lot going on, but I think it helps convey a lot of information. You are best off getting as many buff troops as possible with enough funds remaining filling the rest of filler. The cheapest option being light footmen. Until a certain value, in this case around about 25% buff onwards, where heavy infantry starts to dominate and you are best off investing solely in them. You go from numbers to power. We can do the same for armoured horsemen. Say we were buffing them specifically and wanted to know what unbuffed men at arms to combine them with, or whether it's best to purely go solo, here it's a similar thing. But with an armoured horseman, you need way more buffs before you're best off mono stacking. So with horsemen, if you want to play optimally, you will have to support them right up until late game, or really exploit the buffing system. Note, you should take this all with a pinch of salt. Firstly, as we only see the top, it does hide how marginal some of the differences between combinations are. And secondly, as no buffs in territories is actually impossible to come by, even castles give something, only unstationed regiments have nothing. So results outside of the test will vary. But even then, what if you've filled up that buff regiment? You're still best filling in the remaining of your slots with something, and you might as well pick loads of live footmen to fill it up. And we haven't even considered how all of that works with levies and knights. Speaking of which... So what about knights and levies? I know that some of you, when building your doom stacks, bring along your knights. So let's say we add 5 knights at 20 prowess each to join your men at arms in battle. How does that change it? Now, 20 is quite beefy, but I really wanted to emphasise what impact they have. With knights, light footmen are straight up more effective and cheaper than bows, as are their compositions that include them. And you can see the power of crossbowmen and heavy cavs waned against pikes and heavy infantry. This is because knights are damage dealers, very delicate damage dealers in terms of their damage to toughness. So light footmen are a great pain sponge to buy time for your knights to deal their damage. That said, I say buying time as you won't always want to buy time for, say, enemy reinforcements. Also, knights can get injured and killed, and the longer the battle, the more likely that is to happen. It can get into a whole world of probability, which is way out of scope for this video. But just a quick note, I know late game, many people essentially end up working with a professional army composed of just knights and men at arms. So knowing what works well with them is always something to consider. If you add levies, the opposite happens. Levies are considered cannon fodder and therefore a pain sponge. So troops like bows, crossbows and heavy cav can deal their damage whilst reducing losses. And because of their losses are reduced, they continue to deal more damage. And when fighting less troops, can speed up the battle. So swings and roundabouts really. If you want to add both together, they sort of cancel each other out, but the distinctness of each combination drops as well. The differences become flattened as well. The levies and knights themselves influence the outcome of the battle. Just quickly, I want to talk about quality. One argument thrown is that which troops you should use changes depending on the quality of enemy you are fighting. Now, I've put them up against levies, numerous and weak. 
but importantly, ubiquitous in the game. But just to demonstrate it, here is a graph where we increase the quality of troops you are fighting, going from 100% levies to eventually 100% heavy infantry, with countering removed. And as you can see, nothing much changes. There are some combinations that work better, and some that work worse. But as a rule, a combination of cheap paint sponges and fancy damage dealers seems to produce better results. That said, the gains aren't huge. We're talking 5% better here, 5% worse there. Kind of cool that it's a thing, but I would like to have it more of an influence as a concept. I'm not a historian, but my understanding is that having a mix should be a good thing. Firstly, what does stand out is bows combined with anything performs worse than live footmen. The whole cheap paint sponge thing and all. Secondly, as you get a little bit more money and you transition from the cheaper units to the more expensive ones, you're best off going through pikes and heavy infantry before converting a full stack of light footmen to heavy cav, as the combination of bows and lights with heavy cav performs so much worse than pikes. However, if your heavy cav buffs are disproportionate enough, then maybe mixing light footmen is optimal. Finally, once cross bows are out, bows are completely defunct. They are pretty good, but perform horrendously in planes. Just awful. If we look at the cultural incentives given through traditions, first we have adaptive skirmishes, which promotes lights and bows, and is pretty good. Lights and bows work synergistically. Bows provide the damage, and lights have pursuit, so you have the means to clean up after battle. They are cheap to mass, so very effective from early game, and still relevant when crossbows come along. Perhaps falling down a little bit late game when you want some serious power or have set up a shop in flatlands. Overall pretty good. For formation fighting experts, this one works surprisingly badly. Intuitively I would have thought bows with pike protecting them would work well, like in all the other video games I've played, but it seems that the maps doesn't quite allow that. It's a small antagonism, but certainly noticeable. But the problems get worse. This combination has no pursuit. Yes, the tradition means you lose pursuit for counter efficiency, but pursuit is good, so you'll need to pad your army out with light footman or something to resolve that. Also, the counters. Oh boy, if you're fighting an army of Huskarls or them, you're in a world of pain. These single units counter both of you at the same time, equally. This is not good. The combination before doesn't have that problem. There is no one unit that can counter them both. It is simply perfect in that regard. That said, once you get crossbows, things change. Pikes and crossbows cost the same. Weirdly, crossbows perform better in farms and hills, and pikes perform better in plains and mountains, which is a bit all over the place topographically, but mix them in together and you have a fairly rounded army that works well in most places. Otherwise, with bows, I'm just not sure it's very good. As for hit and run tactics, this is a funny one. In terms of power, it does terribly. I haven't included like horsemen in most of the graphs because it would a be cluttered and b they ain't very good in the battle phase anyway. That said, the combination is pretty good in plains, okay in forests, and that's about it. But this combination will appeal to anyone who likes to chase down enemies before they can blob, and that is quite high risk a tactic. And perhaps you'll have way more pursuit than you actually need, but it is popular. As much as fatality and retreat reductions are great, don't be fooled, hit and run isn't really a thing that works in Crusader Kings, unless you really start to stack up the bonuses to a silly level. Iberia is a good place to attempt this with the Caballeros. But if you want hit and run to be a thing, alas, you may be waiting for a new DLC. Lights and Pikes have done surprisingly well. They are better than bows and pikes at any point and have pursuit to back, so they are very cost effective. That said, if you have this combo, you've not got any damage dealers, so the battle isn't going to draw to a close quickly. So if you want speed, this ain't for you, but otherwise it's cheap, available in tribal, and performs the best for buck. Huzzah. Finally, it's good to see that Hammer and Anvil works well, because pikes and heavy cav are super. Weirdly, if you're looking at farmlands, heavy cab and heavy infantry perform better, but if you switch the terrain to plains or hills, pikes work better. Pikes don't have a bonus in plains, but somehow they work better than heavy infantry, which I find really interesting. That said, the gains are arguably small, but overall this is a solid late game mix composition for a kingdom primarily in the flat. 
and to top it all off, the counters are to damage dealing units such as archers and heavy cav. And with the threat of heavy cav and crossbowmen's late game, I think this counter combo is great. But just beware of the Varingian veterans. So, if you're looking at raw strength without concerns for money, is there any mixed composition that performs better than a mono stack? No. Heavy Cav is better in planes, and Crossbowman clearly better in hills. Do I think the synergy of combinations is as important as the influences of terrain and countering? Also no. So, is there any point in having mixed compositions at all? Well, yes. If we look at Heavy Infantry, the most flexible men at arms. It has no weaknesses, but no bonuses. It has a mediocre counter, and it has no pursuit. It works everywhere, but it's lacking for the strategic minded. Heavy Cav and Crossbowmen, on the other hand, have massive weaknesses, but great bonuses. They have incredible base power, they have good counters, and in the case of Heavy Cav, it has pursuit. They are specialised. What having a mixed composition allows you to do is make your more specialised units to be a little bit more flexible, but without using their niche. Whether it's helping in other terrains, or with costs, or acting as fodder, and this isn't even considering that the terrain may dictate the buildings you can build, that having a variety of counters is valuable, and the synergy, well, that's just the icing on the cake. For me, pikes and heavy cab are the optimal combination. In planes, anyway. And as it happens, drylands too. There is no combination that can take on more. And considering that a full army of heavy cab is horribly expensive, pikes will be a great substitute until you have the money to do so. Pikes cover the heavy cav if you're caught in the hills, the counters are good, it has pursuit, and planes are valuable land if you're interested in yourself and your vassals being minted. Pikes and heavy cav get my seal of approval as the best late game combination for, and a big asterisk here, generic men at arms. I also think pikes and crossbows make a good combination in rough terrain, and the pikes help support the crossbows when you're caught in the flatlands though this combo is missing any source of pursuit. But as always, this isn't definitive. I hope what we've gone through is insightful, but it is nonetheless a closed test. There are so, so many factors that impact the result of the battle and ultimately the war. Factors like money, terrain, counters, enemy counters, cultural traits, buffing, asynchronous buffing, accolades, number of levies, number of knights, knight events, advantage, commander roles, commander traits, commander marshal, lifestyle perks, strategy of the war, playstyle, and most importantly, luck. Trying to visualise all these together can be quite difficult, and I am limited to three axes at most for now. So that's it. Well, for generic men at arms anyway. What about Viringian veterans? Cataphracts? Longbows? Well, they all come into play in their own culture and region and require their own analysis. Because you cannot separate the cataphract from that 15% discount. You cannot review Scandinavia without considering the four extra DLC men at arms. You cannot play India without talking about elephants, bamboo bows, and the jungle. So, forgive me, I think these regions deserve their own video, their own deep dive. And speaking of that, where do you think we should go next? Give me your thoughts. Or just give me your thoughts about the video anyway. Is this interesting? Is it wrong? Am I not missing something blindingly obvious? Is this going to change how you play, or is it completely irrelevant? As always, I'm Kiosk Venev, and thanks for watching.